Well, thank you very much, ladies. We do appreciate that, your effort in providing music today and a theme that is staying within the uh, context of the time in which we are this time of year, which I'll continue in John chapter 17, verse 21. Jesus, of course, we'll read more of this uh, Passover evening. Jesus said that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. Jesus said to be, was said to be one in the Father and in him. We are in the Father and in Christ. That basically means we have the mind of a Christian. The mind of God. That's how we think. That's how we live. That's what we're all about. We think and act as God in Christ. At least that's our goal and our intent. We don't settle for anything less or excuse ourselves from not doing that, but we realize we're not yet Christ ourselves. But we have the same mentality. Well, one, one characteristic we learn to avoid in being in Christ and in God the Father is pride. We learn to avoid, at least we're reminded, not to have pride. Today, the approach often is, if you've got it, flaunt it. If you're great, let everybody know about it. If you have it, flaunt it. 2 Timothy 3, we've read this many times, about the last days, that perilous times, frightening times will come. They're just on the horizon But men and women shall be lovers of their own selves. They love themselves. The focus is on the self. They're boasters and they're proud. We boast. We're proud. We love ourselves. And why should we we be ashamed of that? What's What's wrong with that? If you got it, you've got it. You flaunt it. You don't you don't apologize for it. So we live in an age of pride. We see it all around us, self-aggrandizement, no reverence for pity, or excuse me, no reverence for humility. You're pitied if you wanted to uh, say you were humble. Well, that's for weaklings, for people that don't have it. No wonder they're humble. That's the attitude. So we see it everywhere, social, social media, a lot of attention seekers. Nothing wrong with posting some things. My family does that. Pictures now and then, especially new uh, births that we've talked about. Nothing wrong with sharing certain things from time to time. But constantly posting pictures of ourselves, wanting comments, wanting this recognition and identification, trying to get attention by making films of ourselves, even if they're stupid. Going in his end. Well, you're on a, you're in Phil, you're in, you're instant notoriety. We've talked about all the attention that often athletes demand. Stop and pose. You made a, made a, made a basket. Stop and stare at the crowd. Look at what I just did. Or dance around. Or posing in one way or another. Bragging about it. Boasting. I think tattoos can be a form of this in many ways. And they become addictive. They become addictive. You get one, well, maybe you need another, or well, I should have had this, and next thing you know, you're pretty much covered. And I know I, I st- I'm still getting used to it, because we'll, <laughs> we'll go out to a restaurant with uh, my sons, and here comes the waiter or the waitress, and boy, they've got tattoos everywhere, and I, I'm looking, and they see me looking. They still can't believe it. They said, Dad, come on. This is the way it is. Stop looking like you do not realize that. <laughs> okay, finally have to do that. But I still do look at some of them. Well, Joe Paterno, of course, uh, know of him as a former coach at Penn State University, told his players that scoring a touchdown does not warrant a celebration. Just because you scored a touchdown, it doesn't warrant a celebration, noting you don't want the opponents to think it's the first time you've ever been in the end zone. Why let them think that? So somebody commented here in giving a message not long ago, just about, they were a young adult, mentioned about the vanity that there seems to be. So much vanity today. Everybody concerned about themselves and all of these outward things. 
So it's very commonplace in the looks and the dress, drawing attention to ourselves. We always say not everybody, not everybody. It's not something that everyone is doing to the same extent, but it's more or less a characteristic, a lot of pride. Now, some people might say, well, come on, it's not that big a deal, and you're another generation. Okay, things are different than they were maybe when you were growing up. We used to say all of this stuff with somebody being a hot dog, or hot dogging it trying to get attention to themselves. We always look down on, down on that. Okay, it's different now. So people brag a little bit. So they boast a little bit. What's the big, big deal? They draw a little attention to themselves. What's so bad about all of that? It's not as bad as immorality or crime or something like that. It's just a characteristic. So what? Well, people can view it that way. And I suppose to, in some ways it could be harmless to some extent, but sometimes we can't see the downside to a lot of this. Well, the scriptures, of course, bring that out. Satan uses three primary tools. We find them in 1 John 2.16. Satan uses three primary tools, 1 John 2.16. Three primary areas summarize the world and, and what's wrong with the world, what's wrong with all of us by nature. All that's in the world, what are these big three? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not from the Father, it's of the world. So we often tend to think of pride as the lesser of the three. I mean, come on, it's not immorality and not hurting anything. So what, you brag a little bit. And so what if you show off? So what if you want, a little, want some attention? attention. So what, you, you, you look at yourself in a certain way. That's not, that, that's not that big of a deal. But it is interesting, perhaps, that it's listed third. Remember, faith, hope, and love those three Paul mentions, and the greatest is the third one. Well, could it be that pride of the three? Well, we think of lust of the flesh and the things you lust after with your eyes and desire, you covet. Those are evils. Well, pride, a little bit of pride, a little bit of vanity, a little bit of boasting. Could it be that pride is the leader of all the sins? Not the, the lesser of it. Maybe like money is a root of all, is a root of all evil. Pride maybe is a root of all evil as well. What's the definition of pride? Well, one is self-respect, and that can be fine. Everybody needs a certain amount of self-respect. We would tell somebody, take some pride in yourself. I mean, look at the way you look. Look at the way your look at your property. Look at the way your home is. Or look at your car. Or take some pride in yourself. Or we have pride in our nation or pride in our school. There, there's nothing wrong with those things. That can be right and good. Matter of fact, God said, remember in Leviticus, I'll break the pride of your power, the, the power you respect and you look to, and you give it honor. It's the right kind of pride. So pride is self-respect. Everybody needs some of that. But we also know the second definition is arrogance. An exaggerated opinion of oneself. Something that's exaggerated, it isn't really true. Not sincerity and truth, as we heard a little bit earlier. What's the origin of the wrong kind of pride? Isaiah chapter 14, Isaiah 14, 12. Isaiah 14, 12. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Son of the morning, you powerful archangel, beautiful. Right there, a top three, God's government, God's throne. But he fell. What got to him? Well, the lust of the eyes, the lust of his, he didn't have flesh. How are you cut down to the ground, which weakened the nations, of course, later on? Ezekiel said he was perfect in his ways. But in your heart you said, I will ascend into heaven. I'll exalt my throne above the stars. I'll sit upon the mount of the congregation, the sides and the north. I'll ascend. I, me, I belong there. I'm better than the other two. I ought to be the one to take over. I even know more than God knows. What's the source of that kind of thinking? It doesn't come from God's spirit. Obviously, uh, the devil well, why is it a problem? 
Of course, we talk about being puffed up at this time of year, but why would pride be a problem? Well, hubris, which is another term for a real exaggerated aspect of pride, hubris leads naturally to an illusion of invincibility. It's not truthful. A certain amount of invincibility and a belief in one's own in, in, uh, in, uh, invincibility leads to complacency, carelessness, and failure. You just become complacent. When the Southern Army moved up into the North to invade the North during the Civil War, they came to the area of Gettysburg, and General Longstreet tried to mention to General Lee, this is not good ground. This is not the place we should be having a battle. The, North, the Northern Army have the high ground. We need to move around, maybe towards Washington, and leave here and not have the battle in this, in this spot. And he lobbied for that. General Lee responded, but the enemy is here. We have already engaged them on day number one of that three-day battle. We've already, we've already had a, a short uh, skirmish. I can't ask the men to pull back. They're eager for a fight. I can't, leave, I can't leave the enemy. Well, why not? Well, why can't you ask them to pull back? Nothing's stopping you from doing that. I'm not trying to be critical of, of General Lee. It's something that he admitted on his own. But did even pride enter in there? Well, General Lee's retreating. General Longstreet said, we're not retreating. We're redeploying. We're getting ourselves in a, di- a better spot. Well, no, I, I can't leave. Maybe it was uh, General Lee's leaving. Well, he's afraid. Well, could that be it? Later, he said, it's my fault. When the battle is over, he said, it's my fault. I thought we were invincible. I thought there's no way we can be beat. Not the southern army. Not the southern soldier. doesn't matter what the ground is. We're going to prevail. It's my fault. Well, maybe some pride entered in there. We see pride in many times in conversations, somebody always talking about themselves. Maybe they feel like they know it all, always trying to be one up on somebody else. I've seen people leave the church over pride. Maybe they've, maybe they've been offended. Maybe they really have. But it gets to their pride. I, I've seen people get on forums talking about religious matters, and then they're, they're an open forum, so they're commenting on spiritual things, not wrong of and by itself, but maybe somebody will respond, well, I like that. Well, that was real insightful. Well, that was real. I didn't understand that, maybe that verse in that way. And I've seen individuals begin to feel like they really do know something. They're really kind of special. And it gets to their pride. They become, feel like they're morally superior. Well, they really think in a special way. Boy, they have this insight here in, into the scriptures. And the uh, response from people online causes that pride to build up. That can happen. It was in early, very early in my ministry, not long after I went out into the field. I know there was a very prominent man, uh, uh, pastor in the church, really ordained uh, uh, evangelist in the church. This was the time of changing Pentecost, which, of course, we observed on Monday, and the church realized that it really needed to be on Sunday. It was really rather plain once you look at it and lay it all out, which hadn't been done. You lay it all out. Of course it's Sunday. But the, this individual, very prominent, would not change. And it's kind of a challenging thing for me because I, I had to give the Bible study and I was explaining why it's on Sunday, not on Monday. And he was in the audience. It was quite a challenge for me being a very young man. Here's this uh, very prominent man in the church. But I could see it. It was plain to me. But he never did accept it. Was that because he didn't want to tell brethren, I didn't see this? He liked to think of himself as uh, very knowledgeable of the scriptures. He would have to say, well, I didn't see this. I was wrong. I didn't explain it properly. And he never did change. Never did stay with the church as a result of that. So it can be very... uh, very much affect us and very dangerous. You can have pride in your own humbleness. 
You can be proud of your own humbleness. I saw this the other day on a TV show. I, don't, I think it was some kind of a movie. I only saw part of it, but here was a young man. He had just graduated from college. And in college, he drove this old clunker of a car. And it was really time to replace it. So he graduated, and his parents said, we're going to get you a new car. Now, they were wealthy people. We're going to get you a new car. He says, I don't want a new car. You don't? No, I don't want a new car. And he was sort of implying and explaining he didn't want to ride around in an expensive car and feel like he was superior to everybody and let his parents probably want him to have the new car so they can say, well, there's our son. Don't we have money? Don't we have uh, status? And I don't want that. I don't, I don't want the new car. And so, well, he basically didn't get it. He said, well, okay, fine. But what he couldn't see in is that it was his own pride because he wanted to drive around in a clunker so everybody would say, well, look, at him, look how, look how uh, humble he is. He won't even drive a new car. He doesn't think he's special, uh, more special than anybody else. He, he, he's driving this old clunker. So his own pride, he could see what he thought he saw in his parents and couldn't see it in himself. He liked being seen in an old car. And if that one broke down and couldn't be driven anymore, he would still get another old one, just to show everybody that he doesn't drive a new car. He doesn't try to think he's special. It was artificial, but he couldn't see that either. Well, we all know intelligence, knowledge, puffs us up, our looks, our physique, Our money, our expertise, our talent, our experience, all of that can affect uh, this area of life we call pride. Like the man in the scriptures, I thank thee that I'm not as the others. Couldn't see it in himself for anything. I thank thee, Lord, that I am not as the others. I fast twice in the day or twice in the week and pay tithes. I do religious deeds. I know things other people don't know. All of that can affect us. So is it just a matter of a little bragging now and then? What's that hurt? So what? So what? We've got something, we flaunt it. So what? So what? The girls have a really nice body and then you see just about all of it whenever they dress. So what? They've got it and they flaunt it. You've got a problem with it. So it's your problem. Or the guys boasting or all of that. Well, pride brought down one of the three archangels. At God's throne. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 5, just a couple biblical examples. Second Samuel chap oh, excuse me, Second Samuel 5, that's right. This is kind of a humorous one. In 2 Samuel chapter 5 and verse 6, this is the king, King David. Now he's taken over Jerusalem. His men went to Jerusalem, but they still had those uh, stubborn Jebusites, were holdouts. So King David, 2 Samuel 5, 6, and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, and they said to David, you'll not come in here, but the blind and the feeble will keep you out. (laughs) We don't even need to arm our good men. The blind and the feeble protect us all right. You're not going to conquer where we are in this fortress, this stronghold. David's not going to be able to come in here. Of course, he did. That was the end of that. Too proud, too boastful, too self-confident. How about Daniel 4, verse 30? Daniel 4, verse 30. Now, this is King Nebuchadnezzar. Of course, the great King Nebuchadnezzar. I mentioned this at the feast. Verse 30 of Daniel 4, the king spoke and said, now he'd been warned by Daniel, look king, here's something's going to be coming, it's not going to be good. If you change your ways, you can maybe avoid it. Well, he forgot about that. So a little time later, maybe a year later, the king spoke and says, is this not great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Look at Babylon. Who else could have built this? It was my might, my leadership. My intelligence. Well, while the word was in the king's mouth, it barely got out. There fell a voice from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. You've lost the kingdom. That's as long as you're going to have this kind of arrogant attitude. 
this pride in yourself. And then finally, Acts chapter 12, verse 21. This is a pride of life. Everybody has it. Especially if we say, well, it doesn't affect me. I'm a pretty humble, I'm a pretty humble guy. That wouldn't affect me. I don't think I'm so great. Matter of fact, I'm always running myself down. That's how humble I am. Acts 12, 21, and upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne, made an oration unto them, and the people gave a shout, saying, it's the voice of God, voice of a God, and not of a man. Immediately, the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not God the glory. Then God ever notices that? Think it really matters that God only, oh, what's a little bit of bragging? Oh, what's a little bit of boasting now and then? Not that, that isn't very important. Not like immorality or other evil things. Well, what, do we, what would we say is the main reason Christ has to return to the earth? Would it be the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes? Well, I wouldn't rule that out. But look at Isaiah chapter 2, verse 11. Isaiah 2, 11. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled. The haughtiness of men shall be bowed down. What do you mean? Everybody's not haughty, are they? Have lofty looks? Well, we'll see that we do more than we might think. Well, the lofty looks of man shall be humbled. The haughtiness of men shall be bowed down. The Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that's proud and lofty and upon everyone that's lifted up. And he'll be brought low. That's the world that characterizes the world. We don't need God. Pretty much lifted up and self-sufficient. Want to make, do it on our own. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16. We're centering our thoughts on just the idea of pride. What the Bible has to say about it. How it ties in with the holy days that are coming up, Proverbs six sixteen. These six things does the Lord hate. Which six would, would we pick? <clears throat> yeah, well, actually, there's seven of them. Proverbs six sixteen that are an abomination. A proud look. Oh, what's so bad about that? A proud look. Well, so what? Somebody's a little conceited. That's not bad. Of six, seven things you're going to pick out, and it's a proud look. And seem to rate very high compared to some of these other things, shedding innocent blood, devising wicked, just a proud look. Well, it goes deeper than that, doesn't it? Doesn't like that. Proud, self-sufficient, don't need anybody, better than others, look down upon them, that, that proud kind of look. <clears throat> Satan tells us those things. You're, you know, you're a hot babe, look at you. You're a hunk. You're, you're, you rock, man. We love to hear those things as, a, as individuals. They love to hear that. Enjoy. We, rehearse those, we rehearse those things in our mind because they appeal to us very much. Hollywood often reeks of this very idea. Everything about it. Maybe not every last person there. They're, they're like everybody else, I suppose. But often it reeks of vanity and pride among the stars. I think they're stars in life. Not just in some movie or TV show. Proverbs 13.10, I'll read this to you. Proverbs 13.10, only by pride comes contention. Is there contention? Often it gets back to pride. Somebody's pride. Only by pride comes contention. But with the well-advised is wisdom. Satan thought to tempt Jesus. What did he say? Well, if you're the son of God, oh, son of God, huh? that's what you think? You're really the son of God? Do you think God would protect you? Protect you? Why don't you throw yourself down? Why don't you, you believe in the scriptures? Doesn't it say God will pray? He won't allow your, you know, to dash your foot? And you're the son of God? Throw yourself off here. I'll show you I'm the son of God. Watch this. 
I wonder if that would get to any of us, our pride. Jesus answered with the word of God, <clears throat> went to God's word, that you're not, you're not to tempt God. That's a wrong principle. It didn't get to his pride. Those kind of things get to us. They're great on us often. John chapter 5, verse 19 and 30. John chapter 5, verse 19. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, the Son of Man can do nothing of himself. If we're to be at one with God and the Father, and we're in them, and they're in us, then we cannot have pride. Jesus himself, I can the Son of Man can do nothing of himself, meaning of a spiritual nature without the spirit that God allowed to, to be in him and gave him without measure. So here's him, Jesus even saying, I'm humble. He even corrected somebody when they called him good. Well, now hold on here. He was, he was walking in the flesh. Said, now hold on here. I don't even want you to refer that to me. Let's put God in that category. Son of man can do nothing of himself in verse 30. I can of my own self do nothing. He always referred to the Father. Well, these things are the Father working in me. The Father gets the glory. He gets the recognition. He's a very humble individual. Became a servant, it says, though he was a king. So pride to a Christian is seriously dangerous. Very dangerous. Something we keep, keep check on or we consider and evaluate. This, of course, is a lesson of unleavened bread. Unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. If anybody thinks he can live apart from God, he has too much pride. If we think we don't need God, we don't need God's spirit, we don't need God's way, we have pride too much pride. We think we're fine on our own. It's a naive sense of self-confidence. So we have to be on the lookout for the sin of pride. As I said, often we don't think of it that way. A little bit of boasting, or maybe, maybe we get a little bit too big for our britches now and then, but... Now here's from a... uh, publication I'll read to you. It's taken from Pride to Humility, and it's from Bemidji, Minnesota. Focus Publishers, 2000. And here is Pride, how it manifests itself. Because sometimes it's not easy to recognize. It's easy to, well, I don't have any pride. I feel, I feel like I'm pretty humble and don't think I'm really better than anybody else. I don't really have to worry about that. Maybe some things I, th- I see and desire or lust of the flesh. Well, yeah, though, those things maybe, but eh, I'm, I'm pretty humble most of the time. Pretty decent that way. So what would, be, what would be examples of pride that human beings can get into? Complaining against or passing judgment on God. Well, what about Job? I wonder if that was a problem. His pride in his own goodness. He was a very righteous man. Very good man. And so when something befell him, he really did feel like God was not fair with him. He was holding his righteousness. I don't know what happened to God, what he slipped into. Punishing me unfairly. Wasn't the lust of Job's you know, flesh, wasn't the lust of his eyes, it was something else. Complaining against passing judgment on God, and we can all do that. I mean, we under, why? Why did this happen? We ask those questions. We don't, they're hard often to try to answer. 
lack of gratitude can be pride. Our heart gets lifted up. Why should we be grateful? We deserve this. This should come our way. Of course they should give me this. Well, of course they should help. They're Christians. They should be doing this for me. Anger can come from pride. Remember the, the verse about contention comes from pride? You're angry about something? Why are you angry? Did it hit, hit your pride in some way? Could be. Obviously, seeing ourselves as better than others. Having an inflated view of your importance, your gifts, your abilities. Satan can play on that. People build that up. And the scriptures say, and they'll cleave to them with, with vanities. And with uh, in, in, uh, praises. Get on our better side. Well, you're this and that. And you're the best that's come along. And well, you can't do, nobody does the job like you do. And well, there's no mother like you. Well, no, there's no. Wow. What they say about the one man, he couldn't wear a 10-gallon hat because he had an 11-gallon head? So having an inflated view of your importance, gifts, and abilities, being focused on the lack of your gifts and ability. Oh, that self-bitty, poor old me. Oh, nobody's as humble as I am. Nobody's as lowly as I am. It can be a self-pity. Perfectionism. Being a perfectionist. Sometimes that becomes an extreme. Well, God's perfect. Well, he's not a perfectionist in the way that sometimes it's applied. <clears throat> talking too much. Mainly talking about ourselves. Focus on ourselves. Another one at list, seeking independence or control. Having to be in control of something all the time. Being consumed with what others think. Being consumed with what others think. Obviously, we want to be consumed with what God thinks, first and foremost. Being devastated or angered by criticism. Ooh, that can get to our pride. Something critical. Ooh, that can pierce us that way. Hurts our pride. Being unteachable. I don't need anybody to tell me anything. I know what I'm doing. Being sarcastic, hurtful, degrading. Talking down to others. That's a part of pride. None of these are lust of the eyes and lust of the flesh necessarily. A lack of service. Could that be pride? Well, it's beneath you. Well, I, don't, I don't do that. I don't pick up papers. And I don't do this. And do so. I, I do important things. Not menial tasks. So a lack of service could be pride because it's beneath us. It's for other, that's for somebody else to do. Somebody more lowly. Lack of compassion How about the Holocaust? How about all the atrocities that happened down through history? Or the Holocaust, that was the German superior race, wasn't that? Is these old Jews, we don't need them around. The world would be better off without them. Nothing good about them. We're superior. We're better. We look down on everybody else. Being defensive or blame-shifting very defensive, very protective. Shift that blame somewhere else. Well, it hurts our pride. We've all experienced that. I do. We're all human. And a lack of admitting when we're wrong. That's hard to do. It's not the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. It's our pride of life. Of ourselves. Lack of asking forgiveness. That's hard to do, too. It's our pride. 
resisting authority or being disrespectful, that can be a form of that, voicing preferences or opinions when not, when not asked. I mean, I guess the list could go on and on, but it doesn't really matter. It's not that big a thing. You know, so you boast a little bit. So you think more highly than yourself. So you flaunt what you've got. So you parade around. So you draw attention. That's not hurting anybody. It's just the way, that's just the way people do it. That's not going to hurt anything. Is that really the case? Minimizing your own sins and shortcomings, that's our pride. I don't want to think of myself that way, my own faults and shortcomings and don't measure up. And None of us like to hear those things. I remember when the boys were growing up, I don't know where I got the idea, but I sat them down and and I said, okay, boys, uh, what I think I want to do, I'm going to, tell you all, I'm going to tell you your good qualities and your strengths and what your mother and I admire about both of you. So I gave them a list and they had them, fine boys in many respects. And now, I, now there's a few things I want to mention. Today. We, don't want to, we don't want to hear those. <laughs> Let's not go into those. So I didn't at that time. They really didn't. Well, we would rather not hear those. We don't, we don't care about that. Well, that's all of us. So they were happy, feeling good about themselves at the time, which was fine. Everybody needs that, too. Being jealous or envious. John the Baptist have a lot of pride. Well, Jesus is baptizing all these people. Why, well, he's got so many more people than you are. What do you, what do you think about that? Well, he must increase, I must decrease. That's of God, that's of God. That's, that's the attitude. That's an unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Finally, any, using any attention-getting tactics that gets to our pride. Well, it could go on and on. Now, maybe we don't think of this particular topic that often, or those three, as I mentioned. Maybe pride is bigger in many ways. What are the seven things God hates? A proud Look, it's a self-sufficient, I'm doing fine, I don't need God, I'm fine where I am. One last verse, Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs 16, 5. We all slip into this in some ways from time to time. Just need to be aware of it. Proverbs 16, 5. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. It wasn't Jesus. He wasn't that way. If anybody could have been, he would have been. Satan tried to appeal to him. But if we're proud in heart, so we're humble. Come to God in a humble way. We know that we need him. Anybody that doesn't think they need God is proudful. Too much pride. So this is the time of year we confirm our battle against, obviously, the lust of the flesh. It's a part of it. Lust of the eyes, the things we see and have to have, and perhaps the greatest foe, the pride of life.